Hey everyone and welcome to Sasquatch Theory, a place where people can share their encounters and experiences. In this episode, I contact Dustin from Washington State. He claims a Bigfoot came up to his house one night and killed his dog. It's a very common thing to find Bigfoot encounters and missing dog and people reports in the same area. I used to disagree with the missing 411 because my Bigfoot encounters and experiences were kind of positive for the most part, but I have to keep in mind that these beings are very unpredictable and we can't possibly know what they're thinking inside their mind and know why they're doing what they're doing. A lot of people have also theorized that they feel like they've been marked by the Sasquatch. There is a wide theory amongst the community that expresses the idea of the Sasquatch originating from the Nephilim. Could the mark of the beast have a completely different meaning? And if the Sasquatch are found all over the planet, why does the Bible not mention them? If you guys enjoy listening to Bigfoot Encounters on Sasquatch Theory, then please like and subscribe. Alright guys, let's dive straight into this next Bigfoot interview from the state of Washington. My name's Dustin. I live in Grays Harbor, Washington. We're pretty much right on the beach and also kind of right under the Olympic National Forest. Um, super wooded area, even clear out to the beach. Like you stop seeing trees when you drive on the sand. Um, I've always been outside all my life. I wouldn't say I'm a hardened outdoorsman like I, I don't think I could go out and live off the land for the rest of my life but I was probably the last generation that you know actually like stayed out until dark um so my first I guess sort of experience was I was a senior in high school it was March of 2014, and I get home, you know, run through my homework really quick, and I just go outside and walk around, you know, just check fences because I live on a little farm, and I started noticing these marks on the trees, and it was almost like on the alder it looked like something really big kind of grabbed it and like almost peeled the the bark off thought that was weird i kind of chalked it up to a bear or even you know a deer rubbing their antlers up against it or something and mm -hmm. it was just really strange because it was kind of really high up but not so high that it had to be something massive to do it. Um, and then, you know, the neighbors, they started talking about how their dogs would just fly out of the house at night when they let them outside and they go bark at the tree line and wouldn't let up. And they started hearing a couple strange noises, but they never really looked into it and so that went on for about a week and then it was just kind of normal I guess again for about two three days and um, my first hair raising encounter was I was sitting in my room one night I think it was about 9 30 10 o'clock I was playing Xbox and my mom calls me, like on my phone, calls me, and she goes, Hey, Dustin, do you hear springs outside? And I'm like, springs? Why would I hear springs outside? And she's like, Car springs. I was like, No, hold on, let me go check. 
and I go out there and um, the dogs are going wild at something off to the side of our house and I was like okay that's kind of odd like usually they just well, they would sit on the porch and bark at something you know keep it away from the house so I call them and I go kind of walking over there I don't have a flashlight or anything and I called all three of the dogs and my lab Chewy comes running up and our Rottweiler mix he used Rottweiler German Shepherd Black Lab comes running up to and his name's Spud and our Malamute Sika isn't coming isn't coming and she was usually she's the youngest one of the bunch so she was usually the first one to you because she was a little more spry and I'm calling her and I'm calling her in this little field on the side of the house kind of dips down it's kind of like a little swampy area and I can I heard her whimper and I kind of stopped and I was like okay what just what's going on like this dog doesn't you could step on her and she doesn't whimper like I call her again and I hear her whimper and I get a pretty good idea that she's just like just out of sight on that dip, maybe 120 feet in front of me. And I take a few steps forward and there's this kind of a really low grunt growl. Like I could barely hear it, but it just, made me not want to go further without a flashlight or anything like okay and I ran back inside and I grabbed my dad my 3030 and oh god I can't remember what else but uh we go back outside and we got flashlights now and we're gonna go get our dog because obviously something happened and as we as my stepdad and I come walking out, my mom comes running out, and she pulls her truck over and turns the high beams on to kind of just flood that whole area with light. And we're calling her, and she's still in the same spot, and we get about to where I had stopped before I went back in the house. So she's maybe now, oh, I'd say 190 feet or 100 or 90 feet in front of me. And we can hear something going through the woods. And it was, like, I'm a pretty broad person. And, like, if it was, like, two of me walking through this brush, making as much noise as we possibly could, it was more noise than that. Yeah, like, it wanted to be known that it was big and scary and mad and we had stopped and we were listening to it walk through the woods and it sounded like it was walking away from us and my dad goes okay well I'm just going to scare it off and he shoots around into this into the air and this thing stopped and started coming towards us. We could hear it coming closer to us through all the brush, making even more noise now. Like it was almost all the branches and everything snapping were about as loud as that gunshot was. We took off. I don't think I've ever ran that fast to that point in my life. We're going, my mom's asking us what's going on. We just get in the house now, like go. And it's kind of funny. She locked her truck and left all the windows down. That's the funniest part of the story. And we go running inside 
we hunker down in the front room. My mom goes and gets my little brother and brings him into the house because uh, she has a separated room outside. And so we called the sheriff's department. They said they'd send someone out. We called um, animal control. They said they'd also send someone out. And we're calling our neighbors like, hey, you know, we need more manpower. Just, you know, just drive up and down the road and try to, you know, scare this thing off. You know, we don't know what it is. Be careful. Well, all our calls fell on deaf ears and it was really, really tense in the house. We had all the lights off. We are all just completely silent. And I couldn't tell you what time I fell asleep. It was just, I knew I was up for a while after that. And I'd finally fallen asleep. And the light of day woke me up. And, you know, we have this feeling that when it's light outside, we're safe. So I go running back out there. I'm like, I got to find Sika. She's hurt. And, you know, I need to need to take care of her. And we go, well, I went running out there. And I ran to right where I heard her last night. And she wasn't there. I was like, okay. What is going on? And I went to walk back into the house to get my mom and dad to help me. And as I'm walking back, I just kind of turned around and we had this big travel, well, two big travel trailers that were sitting right there. Kind of one was further back and the one was off to the side and pulled more forward. And she was laying in front of the travel trailer that was more backed in. And So I went running over to her and she was, she was dead. She had this huge, huge, like indent in her head. Like I could have put my whole fist in it and I don't think that would have filled up the indent above her eye. And I kind of, kind of broke down and I was, telling her I was sorry and like I just kind of lost it at that point and my stepdad comes out and he sees that sick is dead and I'm on the ground crying next to her and he sees the big indent he's like well I mean it you know that that couldn't have been the only thing that happened Plus that, and she's been moved since we heard her whimpering. And he starts checking from the base of her neck all the way down, and her right before the front shoulders on her, her neck was all jacked up right there, like it had been like snapped almost. And then down towards the middle of her back, he felt he was kind of pinching all the vertebrae going down. And he pinched one and he felt it like cave in when he pinched. So her back was broken there and like that vertebrae was just destroyed. And I pulled myself together the best I could. It's like, all right, well, we need to figure out if we can find any tracks or anything. So I go over to where we heard this thing making all the noise the night before. And there was just almost like a tunnel cut through the brush where this thing had just been ripping and throwing branches pulling out, you know, little cedar trees and stuff. And, oh, sorry. No, you're fine. Take your time. I'm sorry to hear about your dog, too. 
I appreciate that. And it was. So it left like a tunnel of destruction, like kind of like if a tornado went through or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of, yeah, it, it's wild. And I mean, the, the vegetation still today hasn't quite grown back right. Like you can still kind of see like where it had went through and this is eight years later. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at that and it went about, I'd say about 50 feet in. And that's when it stopped throwing its fit and just, went through the woods and I turned around and I looked at the other trailer that was pulled forward and it had all that gross green algae that grows on things, you know? Mm -hmm. And I seen where some had been like wiped off. Like, well, that's weird. Like we never touched that thing. So, and I went up, and what I had seen was it looked like I'd taken like a like someone would have taken a mop and like kind of brushed across real lightly, and like you could see where like well, I guess that's that's not a good way to put it. It looked more like when you brush up against something with your hip, mm -hmm. like it starts light and then it gets heavy and then it's kind of light again, you know, but. It was like chest height on me. That's odd. So I was looking at the trailer a little more and I looked up and about, I'd say about eight and a half feet up was this huge handprint. I mean, it's, it had to be like a foot long and like 10 inches across and it wasn't, smudged it looked like someone just sat their hand there like i could see the the fingerprints in it and I, you know i could like barely reach up and like touch like the pad of the thumb so i walked around the trailer a little more oh jeez and on the side or on the back side of the trailer there was another thumbprint. I was looking at that and I kind of came out around to in front of the other trailer so it had been kind of facing the house from the back of that trailer and this handprint wrapped around the corner like it was peeking out and looking at us at one point which was where I'd found that print was maybe six feet from where we had found my dog it, it never really crossed my mind that it was a Bigfoot until I seen that handprint my one of my teachers at school was going into professional football and was the biggest person I've ever met and his hands were dwarfed by this handprint. And I mean, like he, he could grab, you know, he could do the palm thing with the basketball. He didn't have to do any of that like weird prep that, you know, regular size or people with regular size hands have to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, dwarfed his hands and I remember I almost didn't want to think it was a Bigfoot because the way you know my family had already had always talked about if Sasquatch was real like it, it's a protector of the woods you know like the native Native stories, like it's it, it watches over the wildlife and makes sure you don't do anything bad to it. And, you know, I went down and I talked to a good friend of mine down the road. And, 
he he didn't know what to make of it, but he's like, you know, it's probably a bear. You know, I I wasn't there that night. It was probably a bear, though. Like, I'm I'm gonna be real with you, and I don't know that it didn't make sense for it to be a bear because bear don't have or bears don't have hands and don't you know when they kill a dog like that they would leave marks you know like claw marks and whatnot and he told me to ask another guy just down the road who was I think at this time he was about 80 years old and he's lived there all his life and had a very long family history in the area and so I went and talked to him and he's like oh you know it could have been a cat they got retractable claws and you know and it's like okay well with all the noise that that made and just the tunnel of destruction that's there's no way it was a cougar like if and if it was like it was in the biggest cougar I've ever seen or been around or near like and I had talked to a few more people and someone said well you know just just literally a few houses down from you is a a guy that actually looks for Bigfoot around the area you know maybe go talk to him oh okay that's perfect i'll go talk to him and i told him my story and he was just baffled just he he didn't have anything else to say he's like i can't tell you for sure because i wasn't there but that's nothing that is scientifically known and he told me that he had actually been getting off work late and he'd come home and across the river at his house he was hearing whistles and he said he heard a whoop and and it was all at night so it wasn't birds you know they stay pretty quiet at night and he said that all stopped that night here the the stray gunshot come from up the road which was my stepdad and he said he was gonna he was gonna look into it a little further and i think life just got busy for him and he never really did but uh That one was just, I don't know. I I just felt like that whole night was just kind of like a glitch in the matrix, you know, like that wasn't supposed to happen or I wasn't supposed to, you know, experience any of that. And I had to really fight with it and like really sit and analyze a lot of the, of what happened, like making sure I wasn't, you know, just coming up with ideas to make me think it was Bigfoot, and like, it it just I I don't know how to explain it, really. Um, Like, I, I just felt like my mind was just chasing that because nothing else made sense. But even looking back at it, no wildlife around that area doing that to my dog makes sense. And not even someone, you know, high as a kite on any sort of, you know, barbiturate makes sense. Like it, she was a 120 pound Malamute. I, 
don't care how big or doped up you are, that dog's going to get the best of you. And it also really helped that, like, that tunnel of destruction still there. You know, it's kind of the upper part mostly that's still there where it's grabbing these branches that were 10, 12 feet up in the air and snapping them. That sounds like Bigfoot activity to me. Yeah, and I don't know. I, I fought with that for a long time in my head. Like, no, there's got to be something else out there. And, well, there's really nothing else out there unless there's a 10-foot tall human being running around that we don't know about, but that might as well... You know, that's still in the it's still in the realm of Bigfoot or you know, I guess there's there might be giants among us in some parts of the world, but I just I don't know. I've only recently come to grips with yeah, that must have been that must have been a Bigfoot. Uh, honestly, I mean, I didn't see anything that night. So, you know, the whole scene is believing thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't 100% say it was Bigfoot, but nothing else makes sense. Have you had any more experiences after that? Yeah, I've had a couple... Well, one that was very well, in the same realm of that um, scenario where I didn't see anything, but, you know, a person could end on that, a bear could end on that. And uh, then one actual sighting encounter. So I'm just going to go chronological here. So this was... After I had graduated, it was that summer, me and a friend of mine, we loved to go up into the woods and hunt coyotes and grouse. And those were mainly our two things that we really went after, especially because uh, in Grays Harbor County, the uh, Fish and Wildlife deemed coyotes a nuisance because the population just exploded for some reason. And they were actually killing deer and taking, just eating up all the grouse. So it was kind of a kill on sight kind of thing. We'd go up into the woods at like four o'clock in the morning and just be out there for hours. Might come back down to a little local store by the school, grab a soda and something to eat and go right back out. And one day we were talking about it and it's like, man, we should just set up like a little, little shooting shack kind of thing, you know? So we just have a spot we go and we sit and we just wait and, you know, try to call in the coyotes and instead of burning up fuel, just kind of driving it up and down log and road all day. So... We went and scavenged a bunch of plywood and two by fours and just any nails that we could find. And we put up the ricketyest little lean to kind of thing. I don't know. Anybody with a carpentry background would have been extremely disappointed in us, but it kept the rain off of us and we had a place to sit. And we'd put it up in the spot that we'd found. It was, you'd come up this logging road and you'd see the trail. And it was about, I'd say about half a mile hike up to our little spot. And the spot opened up into a fairly good sized meadow. I'd say it was about three, four acre sized meadow. No one had went up that trail in 10 years like it was you didn't see any like beer cans laying around nothing it was 
I'm like, okay, this this seems pretty good. Like it's far enough from the road to where the animals will feel safe, but still also kind of get a little adventurous and maybe come to a call. So we're sitting there. It's about two thirty in the afternoon, and um, my buddy. Yes, gets this whiff of something, and he's like, "Man, do you smell that?" Doesn't know. He's like, "All right." He's like, I, "I don't know. Maybe you know, it's the old coat I'm wearing." And about ten minutes later, he's, "Dude, there's no way you can't smell that." And I don't know what it was, but as soon as he said that. I smelt it and it was like skunk cabbage and wet dog and just, um, kind of musky, I guess. The really odd smell. And I remember like the breeze had finally kind of come in and I was like, Oh, you know, maybe we're getting, you know, some, some of the air coming up from the wetlands because there's just these random little swamps all throughout the woods up here and he's like yeah maybe I you know we're we're far enough up that it it could be a hog we kind of just went about our business and the smell just got stronger stronger and stronger it's just almost unbearable. And I remember he's like, he looked at me, he thought I was sitting there ripping ass. And he had it, he had pulled his shirt up over his nose and I was like, dude, you, you need to figure out what's wrong with you. And I was like, dude, it's, it's not me. It's not me. I promise you. And he, like well if it's not you then what is it and like I have no idea like it's bad and we had sat there and we were trying to listen to see if something was coming in you know maybe it was a hog and we we're just bracing ourselves and we just hear this thud and just this stupidly loud thud come from behind us we about you know, broke through the wall trying to get out of this thing when we heard it. And we go running out. We've got our guns up. Like, what in the world was that? And he's scanning around, and I try to see what made the noise. And I look down, and sitting behind our little shack is... This branch, it's about eight feet long and about six inches down on the thick end. And just laying there behind her shack and I was like, what in the world? And it hit the back of the shed so hard that it ripped like two, three layers of the plywood out when it hit. And... He, he went, dude, listen. And we heard this thing running. And when I started to hear it, it sounded like it was about 100 yards out. And it was, it was moving. Like, I, I didn't see it, but I could hear, like, it was it was clearing some ground real fast. And it was, I'd say about 20, 30 seconds of listening to this thing. And it sounded like it went a mile. It was so weird. And it's like, you know, nothing runs that fast that can throw a branch that I know of anyway 
And I don't know how to describe, but it, you know, it's, it's pretty dense in there. And usually if something's moving about, I'd say 300 yards away and trying to make noise, like you can barely hear it. But I could tell this had already went across the road and into the other side of the real dense brush and everything. And we were like, all right, well, you know, let's, let's just go back to cruising roads. And we, I'm not going to say walk, but we were kind of jogging down the trail, just trying to get out of there. We were freaked out. And it come down and I can see my, my little Jeep pickup through the trees and it's kind of sitting in the sunlight almost. I can see these big smudges across the windows. Like when you touch your windshield and kind of smudge it, I just, okay. And I get down there and I've, I've had bear come up to the truck and like kind of like mouth the windows trying to sniff what's in the truck because I always had you know jerky fast food wrappers any sort of snacks that you know bears would like in there and I come down off the trail and there's these rocks and they're all like football sized and kind of long and oblong going around my little jeep pickup and my heart just dropped like you don't outline something that you know it's just there you know like they they were marking my truck And, I mean, they were big enough to where I had to move them out of the way to drive over them with my pickup. And we we tore out of there. It was just like, all right, we're 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 done for the day. Like, we're, we're leaving. And we went back to my buddy's house. And... We told his dad what had happened. And his, it's kind of funny, his his dad is actually older than my grandpa. And he just kind of got real serious. And he's like, don't, don't go back up there. If I were you, I would just leave the plywood, whatever. Like, that's, that's the, it belongs to the forest now. Well, being the stupid 18 year old kids that we were were like, no, we're just going to, you know, take the rest of the day off and we'll go up there and get it. And we'll just move it in the morning. So we head up there. It's, and say we finally got brave enough around about seven o'clock to leave the house to head up there. And, we come up to the trail and park and the rocks are the rocks weren't there anymore. And I literally just like kicked them out of in front of my tires, the ones that were in front of my tires and just pulled out of them. But those big rocks aren't anywhere to be found. And I noticed that and then it kind of, it gave me kind of a uneasy feeling and then we stopped and we opened the doors and just this feeling like just leave like don't don't go up the trail just came over us both and we kind of sat there with one leg out the truck like we were both getting ready to get out and go get the 
get that shed and just we were both kind of just struck and just kind of froze and right there we should have just called it good and left but we were kind of calmed down like uh, you know it's just us psyching ourselves out you know especially with what happened yesterday and so we talk ourselves into going up there and getting it and get pumped up like all right like literally we're just gonna go in there and just kick the walls out and we're gonna bring them down in you know four walls and a roof say and we hug up the trail and this is feeling of just you're not welcomed here and we we're being watched it was still just wreaking havoc on my body like i was sh- like shaking and like uneasy like my stomach hurt i like thought i kept seeing like all these like little shadows all over the place almost and we finally get up to where the shed is and it's completely obliterated and i mean like we had full sheets of like i think it was three eight inch plywood that was grabbed like you oh i don't know how to explain it but it was broke down the middle like someone had grabbed each end and just bent it in until it snapped. And then it was just thrown out into the middle of this meadow and there was pieces of it hanging up in trees and oh, there's just this extremely uneasy feeling like I can only imagine what people feel like when you're like a police officer feels like when he has to like go do a wellness check and he has to bust in the door and he kind of knows that that person's not all right. I just kind of dread. Here we go. And I remember I went to turn and look at my buddy and we just heard this growl, scream, kind of gurgle. It was wild and it just shook us to the bone. And our only instinct was run. It was, there's nothing good that was going to come from just standing there. We didn't say a word the whole way down the trail. We just ran, bailed in the truck, took off. I've never driven down a logging road that fast ever before or after that. And we come up to, uh, where the pavement starts and I pull over and kind of, I have to collect myself, you know, my, the, I guess the adrenaline was starting to wear off. So I was, you know, shaking and just not in good shape. And my buddy's just like, dude, I have, no idea what in the world that could have been. And he's like, I'm not going to lie to you. Like there's been nothing in these woods that's ever scared me so badly. And me and this friend, we've, we've went, you know, I'm not going to say toe to toe, but we've come face to face with, you know, a big black bear here and luckily black bear are pretty 
docile as long as the cub isn't around. But, like, we... We get adrenaline from that, but it was like a... Oh, we played with death adrenaline, now we're all giddy and happy, you know? But this was, like... We almost died kind of adrenaline. And... I've... I've never been so quick to just run because usually predators are, yeah, predators have that, you know, you run and they chase, but it was just like, we didn't care, like, as long as it was behind us and we couldn't see whatever this was. That was better than standing our ground. And I, even to this day, I still haven't really gone back up to where that happened. Uh, it, that one was really traumatizing. Like, mm-hmm. And the scariest part is that sound it made sounded like it was like 10 feet away from us just kind of like tucked into the tree line almost like it was way too close for comfort (sighs) getting chills so after that uh friend and I, we decided to not go up there for a while. And we started hunting on the um, other side of the woods that you got from a different different town. They're the same woods, but I mean, from where we were to where we went was about 20 miles as the crow flies. So, him and I are, I think we were just kind of out there just messing around. I had just bought a brand new rifle. It was a little, little tiny uh, 17 Winchester Super Mag. And, I thought it was so cool. It was the fastest rim fire, or yeah, fastest muzzle velocity rim fire that has come to the market. And we're out there. We went and sighted it in, and then we're, you know, shooting, you know, cans that we had in the truck, and just, just having, you know, fun playing with this new rifle that I had, and. We're getting ready to head out, and as we were coming by this big uh, game field, I don't know if you you guys have game fields where the wildlife department will actually kind of mow down and keep a field real nice for different animals to lay down in and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Oh, we were driving through and we seen this big blue grouse. It's huge. Fly down and into that field. I was like, okay, well, he looks tasty like I want him. And so I stopped the truck as quick as I can and I'm standing there kind of on the ditch line looking into the field trying to find him. And I see this shape, and it almost looked like when someone sits up against a tree, uh, you know, they got their back to it and their head's sticking out. It kind of looked like that, but a little off. I couldn't make out the neck, and 
looked like I was looking at it from the side, so their shoulder would have been facing me. But it looked like they were kind of like slouched down, like resting or taking a nap or maybe even dead. And I seen that through the scope, and I was like, okay. So I started yelling because I thought it was a person. You know, we got people that are picking mushrooms and peeling cascara bark and who knows what else out in these woods. So I start yelling at him, you know, hey, like, what are you doing? And it just sits there. And I just remember, come on, man, like, can't be doing that. You gotta, you gotta let me know you're there. And it still sits there. It was about 200 yards out. It was completely across the field. So I keep yelling, you know, hey, just talk to me. And I go across the ditch and over this little fence into this big game field. And I'm walking. And I remember I looked down the scope again. I was like, maybe it was just a stump or something that I had seen. Because it was just, it wasn't a very bright day. So looking into that underbrush through the scope, like it was, you might as well just like kind of squinted your eyes and tried to see it. And... I look back, I was like, no, like, that's definitely person-shaped. Emptied my gun, had it cleared, and I'm trying to zoom in more on it, but it's just, something wasn't working right. I don't know if it was me or the $20 scope I had on the gun. But uh, I throw my gun on my back, and... I go kind of jogging up and now I think, you know, this is someone that's, that's hurt. Got to make sure they're all right. And I'm yelling like, Hey, no, just, just got to stand up and wave at me. Like just acknowledge I'm here. And it's still sitting there. I was like, Oh no. So I started running and I make it about 80 yards away from the, tree line there this figure finally moved i was like okay cool maybe they just don't speak english and now they're trying to wonder why i'm running up on them and it looked like it kind of like rolled over onto its hip and was like getting up and it stood up and its whole head was in the trees in the tree limbs so what I seen was from, I'd say, kind of like under the collarbones down to about above the knees. And it was massive. I couldn't, I couldn't get a whole lot of detail because it happened so quick. I could tell it was hairy and kind of shaggy almost. And the arms were huge. I think they were like the size of my, my legs, just massive. Um, I've seen that it had fingers that were, you know, proportionate with its size. But if I had to guess that that tree line, you right where the the bottom of the tree canopy is, it's got to be 11 feet up off the ground. And the underbrush that was under there, the underbrush is usually about two, two and a half feet tall. And it let out this growl. I'd kind of, I'd kind of stopped running when I seen how big this thing was that just stood up in front of me. And I knew it wasn't a bear because of the arms. You know, when a bear stands up, like it kind of has a very 
goofy posture to it. And the arms aren't perfectly on the side when they stand up. They're kind of in front. But this stood just like, you know, you or I, arms completely on its side. And just, it let out this growl. That was just, but low. I'm not really good with sound or any of its, um, you know, like little, like, I guess, octaves. Like, it would have been, like, just, I guess, like, right before we could stop hearing that range of frequencies. And it, when it growled and, like, everything kind of clicked in my head, it was almost like, I had been tased. Like I just like everything in my body just froze and I fell kind of backwards. Every muscle in my body froze. I fell. The growl kind of dissipated and everything was, you know, freed again. And I remember I rolled over and, took off and I was yelling at my buddy, you know, get in the truck, get in the truck. We need to go like, just go, 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 go. And I remember looking back and it was still standing there, the same spot that, you know, it's whole head in the trees. And I had hopped in the truck and I slammed it in the first gear and I looked back and it, was gone. And I I just drove home. Like I didn't care what my buddy said. Like I dude, I'm going home. I'm I'm done. Like I'm just no. I, I can't. Like something like that happens again, I'm probably gonna have a heart attack and just die and then it's whatever after that. But that was probably the single most scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Just the sheer, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, you know, F off big, but this thing was big to people who are F off big. What do you believe the Sasquatch was trying to do underneath the tree? I, I'm not completely sure. The only thing I could think of was, Maybe seeing what we were doing, or maybe he also seen the grouse. I don't know why I'm saying he. I, I didn't see any like, defining features, but that's what I'm just going to say. Mm-hmm. Do you believe that maybe he was hunting the same grouse that you were in pursuit of? Yeah, or just seeing if I was leaving his woods, and then when I didn't, he just stood his ground just either way I wasn't wanted there do you think the individual you saw was male or female I think with how low that growl was because you know in men and a lot of other species usually you know, with people in a lot of other species, men usually have the deeper tones. So I, I think it was a male. I didn't, I didn't see any breasts or anything like that, but just the sheer size and just the tone, I would say it was probably a male. Okay. Now with your experiences with the Bigfoot, do you feel like you've been marked and maybe they've been following you or do you think it's just coincidence and they happen to be at the different places that you go to? I, I almost feel like it's both. Um, you know, I live in the Pacific Northwest, which is a self-proclaimed Bigfoot capital of the world. You know, I don't know. I guess I could, you know, see how, if, if they had seen me, you know, shooting the coyotes, I could see how that was, conceived as ill intent Mm -hmm. because I wasn't because I just pick them up and take them to the game department 
Do you feel like it possibly could have angered the Sasquatch that you were seeking out the coyotes and trying to hunt them? I think so. Um, I feel like it might be just the wastefulness of it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but when we got ran out of the shed, I, I, I feel like we had been scoping that spot out for a while and it was really nice and... I feel like maybe that might have been just a little too close to somewhere where they were, you know, staying during the day. And I definitely feel like that area isn't, you know, too big to where if there was multiples of them where they couldn't, you know, not communicate. What do you think the message was when they placed all of the rocks in a circle around your truck? I feel like they were definitely taking a note of what vehicle I drove. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, okay, this guy's just getting too close to where we are. And it's almost as if they were letting you know they were around. Yeah. In a, I, don't know. I never thought I'd be kind of scared of something to do with rocks. Dude, that was bone chilling. Like, I, I felt marked. Like, there might as well have been a laser light on my forehead. And you also experienced some activity prior to discovering the rocks placed around the truck. Yeah, with the branch mm -hmm. hitting the back of that. I mean, you know, it was a big branch. I didn't pick it up, but I can't imagine that thing weighing less than 40, 50 pounds. Mm. And it hit so hard that it, it chipped out, you know, plies out of this plywood. And I don't know if you've, have, have you ever hit an, an axe against a piece of plywood? Yeah. It's, it's pretty dense stuff. Like, it, it takes quite a bit of energy to get get through it mm -hmm. let alone with a blunt object both of those spots were within 50 miles as the crow flies to the ocean have you looked up any reports in the past and maybe found some encounters that took place near this area i i have um i didn't like actually look and see what the reports were. Mm -hmm. I just kind of looked at the map markers. Um, there were quite a few near me, but it seemed to be way more populated or way more, uh, way more markers up towards, you know, the Olympic forest area and in between the ocean and there that's where a lot of it seemed to be in my area on two separate occasions you found handprints is that correct yeah the first one with with the dogs it, it definitely seemed like I, I don't know if it was while i was walking out there without a flashlight and it you know, kind of dipped back behind the trailer and watched me walk in the house, or if it was afterwards when we all came running in the house with, you know, after the gunshot, and after all that insanity, if it was checking to make sure the coast was clear so it could, you know, put, do what it was going to do to the dog. Mm -hmm. And then the smudge marks on the truck, it, I don't know. I, I've, I've seen bears doing it because of food in the truck. My only thing that I could think of is why they looked in on the truck was to see what was going on and try to get clues to what we were doing. 
Um, I have usually when it was a Jeep Comanche pickup, so it was just a single cab with a bench seat. And we had our all our shells sitting there. Well, all the ones that we didn't have on us, all our spares. Shells sitting in between or in the middle of the seat. And we also still had a couple shotguns sitting in the truck, too, that we'd use for grouse. But we just had our rifles when we were up in the shack. So, I mean, I have no doubt that they know what guns are. Because, I mean, there's just so many stories of people shooting at them or, you know, there's a lot of hunters that have seen them. I imagine that they know that that piece of steel in our hands is no good. I definitely feel like due to my actions in that current situation well, with the two hunting ones anyway they felt like I wasn't doing or you know they didn't like what I was doing so mm-hmm. I, because you know I was essentially coming on to their property with a gun with intent to you know harm wildlife so, you know, that, that that would roughly translate into, you know, me walking into someone's yard pointing a gun at their dog. Yeah. Like they're you're gonna combat that. Like they're they're not just gonna you know, you're not just gonna stand there and let someone walk into your yard and shoot your dog. Like that's just not how we are. Well, and I can't imagine that that's any different for them. Sorry. Yeah, they. I think you know they understand hunting and getting food, but I think it's just more of competition. They want what you're after, and they were probably planning on hunting in that same area, and they don't want you in there. Yeah, and I mean, you know, even even just a shot from say like a two two three. Well, that's a bad example because those are loud. But you know, even a smaller caliber shot through the woods, like it's gonna scare all the wildlife from that area. Yeah. For, you know, even upwards of a few days, they won't come back because they think they're just going to come back and get shot, you know? Um, I, I, I don't know. I always grew up kind of with a native American background. I'm, I can't remember the percentage, but I know my, both my grandparents that I know are native and my biological dad is actually in a tribe somewhere here in Washington. I'm not too sure. So I kind of always grew up with the idea that they were the protector of the forest and kind of almost a spiritual being in the sense of kind of like a guardian angel sort of Mm -hmm. and they're able to you know judge you as a person in the situation that you're doing or that you're in you know Mm now is that your theory or is that ancient knowledge um, I, I feel like that's kind of my theory I feel like you know we're not spiritually connected but they know enough about people that they can watch them you know for just a short amount of time and know what they're doing whether it's good bad you know if it's a trophy hunter or if it's someone that's actually trying to feed their family yeah because you know people are are creatures of habit. Like we kind of do the same thing day in, day out. All right. Yeah, that's, that's all I got. Um, thank you for listening to me nervously spout 
my encounters. Well, I appreciate you sharing them with me, and you shared your story by email, and it lines up with exactly with what you just described to me, so I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry about all the roundabout with it. Um, no, no, you're fine. And if yeah, you have just, any more questions, you have my number, and you can shoot me a message anytime. Yeah, and thanks again. I I do feel a lot better after this. It made me, I don't know, it's really nice talking to someone that actually listens, you know, instead of just kind of discounting. Yeah, and I understand what it's like to lose a pet to these things. I lost two when this group showed up around my place, and they were going to the edge of the woods or in the woods at like 2 in the morning and barking down in the creek bottom, and they both just went missing around the time that I had my encounters. So I, I, I don't know for sure that's what it was, but I can bet it probably was. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about that. No, it's, I mean, it's fun. It's it's rough. Yeah, well, there's no other way to describe it. Yeah, I mean the dogs don't know any better because they're just barking and trying to protect the people, and I think the Sasquatch are trying to move in and out and do their routine things, but they keep getting caught and alerted by the dogs. Yeah. So. And, uh, it's just hard yeah, to know, right. you know, to put your dogs up when these things are around because you, you won't know they're around. Just yeah. Because they're so silent. Yeah, and I can tell you right now, they can be loud when they need to be. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, and it's terrifying. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks again. I can't thank you enough. I appreciate you listening and everything that you do, man. It's, it's awesome. Well, thank you, and I appreciate people like yourself having the bravery to share these encounters and share it with other people, so maybe it'll help them out in the future. Yeah, I'd I definitely suggest to anybody out there that you're definitely the person to get a hold of and try to talk to about it. Well, I appreciate it. I don't I don't always have the best things to say, but I'll definitely listen. <laughs> okay. Sometimes that's all we need. All right, Dustin. Well, I appreciate your time and effort. And, yeah, you have yourself a good day and get a hold of me sometime. All right. Well, dude, I'll have to send you, a, like, a video of me driving up some of the logging roads around here. Yeah, for so you sure. can kind of see how it is. Yeah, I've been All wondering. Right. I, I was trying to picture it in, in my mind when you were telling your story the best I could. The best advice I can give you is the woods are darker than you think up here. Yeah, if anything, it's I'll wild. snap some photos and some clear photos and send them send them my way. All right, we'll do. All right. All right, Dustin. I'm gonna let you go and. Again, I appreciate you talking to me right. and sharing everything. All right, man. You, you have a good good night, too. Yeah, I'm you gonna... too. And if you think of anything that you forgot to ask, just, just shoot me a message. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm. Bye. See ya. Thank you, Dustin, for taking the time to share your encounters here on Sasquatch Theory. I know it was difficult for you to talk about, and I appreciate you opening up. To me, Bigfoot abduction is a fact, and I have talked to several people who have reported Sasquatch taking or even killing their pets. I recently created a documentary with a guy named Dennis here in Missouri. He claims he saw a Sasquatch that took his dog Quigley and had him in a bear hug. As he desperately called for his dog Quigley, the dog managed to break free and run back to Dennis. The farmer claims he heard a strange whistle up in the woods and Quigley ran up there to investigate, ignoring Dennis's calls and he was never seen again. That is an awesome encounter video I recently uploaded 
And if you guys have not seen it, I recommend you do. That is it for now, and I appreciate everyone watching.